Okay, thank you everybody for bearing with us as we prepared Zoom to do its thing. Um, I want to introduce uh, this evening's program as Integrating Physical Events and Social Context. Chris uh, Harrison, a, a professor of the Human Computer Interaction um, Group at, at um, Carnegie Mellon University is here with us and uh, I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Um, before we um, before we start, I will just go ahead and say a few things about, um, about us. We are Bay Chi. Um, we are a local chapter of um, ACM, Association of Computing Machinery. Um, and uh, Chi, Sig Chi is a, very, uh, is, is a very active group within ACM. It's the second largest um, group after, after uh, SIGGRAPH um, with thousands of, of people. Um, the local organization um, is uh, this, and we, we run a talk every, every month. Um, you know, if you feel like it, you can join. Uh, it's $20 a month annual membership. And you get uh, to be part of the community and monthly meetings and the newsletter and job bank. Um, we've started a Birds of a Feather um, this uh, year on Careers in Kai. And it meets kind of the third week of, of the month um, and Edwin Lee runs it. Um, and uh, that's, that's um, uh, a lot of fun. Um, and we also are interested in doing more. And um, if somebody was willing to work with me, we would make a, uh, a birds of a feather about, um, about being more active uh, um, people in HCI. I would, um, help to people to think about the papers they're writing and other things they want to do. Um, here is a, uh, a list of some of the things you could do if you want to be part of things, which is to volunteer at baykai.org. So just send us an email. And then another thing that happens is the first Thursday of the month at 7.30 p.m., uh, there's a Zoom uh, where the people that are thinking about what this organization is going to do get together and, you know, share a little bit. They share a little bit about what they're doing, but mostly we talk for not, not long, it's an hour, uh, about what we can do as a community to be better at being us. Um, and uh, I guess I want to um, just go back to um, talking a little bit about Chris Harrison, not a long time, but I wanna just say that um, the first time I ran into Chris Harrison, he was a graduate student and he was giving a talk at Kai, and he was in the big tent. He'd gotten a best paper award, and he was uh, probably, I don't know, 1,500 people in the room. And what struck me was uh, the maturity of his, of his talk. His talk had a wonderful scholarship and explanation of the background and reasons for what he was doing, and then a really well a planned set of experiments, and um, he was extremely good at answering questions. No, no doubt he got a job right away uh, as soon as he got his PhD, which was very soon thereafter, um, working in one of the best human-computer interaction groups in the world. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and Chris, you can go ahead and um, take over. I just want to say that this will go on for you know, um, less than an hour, maybe 50 minutes, and then we'll have questions. And um, what I want to also um, add is that, um, that uh, I want people to know that they can go to the live, uh, live transcript at the bottom of their screen and turn on uh, um, closed captioning if they want. So we're trying to do closed captioning on all of our events. And um, that also... Um, Chris wants um, you not to not you know to 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 not be shy about um, asking for clarification during his talk, and we'll try. Um, he'll try, and I'll try, or we will try to make him uh, aware of them um, as they go. Of course, we don't want to break up the, the the talk too much, so don't. Nothing should be a very long question uh, during the talk. There'll be plenty of time afterwards to go to go into that. So, Chris, uh, I. I didn't mean to keep you uh, long, but I'm really excited uh, to hand this over to you. Please uh, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for uh, joining me this afternoon or this evening. Um, that was a, a wonderful introduction, Ted. I hope I can live up to that high uh, bar. 
Um, I'm not going to be going into incredible depth in this talk. I wanted to actually purposely show you the breadth of projects and research that I've been working on. Uh, but underlying a lot of those, or all of them, are those uh, hopefully rigorous uh, studies. But what I do want to show you is a breadth of projects and as much as possible, like to show you the raw signals uh, underneath these things, because I do believe kind of you know, seeing is believing. So the, you know, the title of my talk is not only integrating physical events and social context, but that's a bit dry. And I think really a more apt name for my talk is, you know, why are smart devices uh, so dumb? And if you happen to work in that industry, I apologize, but I might be kind of poking fun at some of your uh, uh, products. But I do believe that we've kind of assigned this smart moniker on a lot of different devices and, and experiences, and they're really not as smart as we might hope them to be. And I want to kind of unpick that today and show you some of the work that my group is doing to try to attack that future of actually smart and assistive devices. So just a little background, uh, Carnegie Mellon University is a, is a giant place. There's something like 200 faculty in computer science, uh, in a school of computer science. Inside of that, because uh, faculty meetings would be absolutely insane with 200 people in them, uh, we have departments. And one of those departments and one of the first departments in the world uh, dedicated to HCI is the Human Computer Interaction Institute. And inside of that, I lead a group called the Future Interfaces Group. Uh, I also have a startup. Uh, it has uh, offices both in Mountain View and in Pittsburgh, and it's, it's kind of a, becoming a leader in the tiny ML space, and it's machine learning software, which powers interactive features, has been ins installed on something like 250 million phones uh, and devices to date. So we're looking at things like the next generation of multi-touch, you know, what's beyond multi-touch, what we see today, we've already shipped some features there, and we also have helped uh, some smartphone makers launch uh, full screen phones. In fact, the first full screen phone that did not have a notch had to virtualize the proximity sensor so you didn't have to interrupt that bezel. That solution was powered uh, by the technology that kicks out. So just to give you a bit of background on how you know, we unlock these new forms of technology, I really think there's sort of three pillars that my research lab and the startup sits on. One, of course, is sensors and signals. We, you know, we want to get interesting uh, kind of data on which to build new computing experiences. And that fundamentally means we're gonna have to reach out beyond mice and keyboards and traditional screens and to think about more unique things. And that fundamentally means we have these unusual signals to work with and we have to make sense of them. And so to do that, we need robust tools like machine learning and computer vision to make sense of those often very ambiguous uh, human uh, signals. And then another kind of, a, I would say, tenant of the lab is physical prototyping. We really believe that if you want to prototype the future, and especially new form factors, that you have to actually make the thing. You can't, you know, show people what a device is going to look like and show it to them on a tablet or on a laptop. It'd be like showing people, you know, an iPhone in 2007, but showing them on a laptop and say, hey, would you want this in your pocket? just doesn't work like that. People really need to be situated in the context as much as possible, walking around with a crazy thing on their head or in their pocket, on their wrist and so on to really understand it. So we make a lot of electronics, we make a lot of uh, physical prototypes to really understand how these computing experiences are going to work in practice. In terms of a bit more of an ethos, uh, I like to think about approaching problems in HCI is almost like kind of baking a cake and thinking about what kind of computational ingredients that we might be missing that could allow us to make whole new you know, cakes, or at least better versions of existing uh, kind of cakes. And by cakes, I mean user experiences. And I like this metaphor because it takes a lot of ingredients to bake a delicious cake. And so we're often drawing on other fields like natural language processing or computer vision or cloud compute or sensors and so on to make breakthroughs. And often we'll bring sort of our new ingredient, you know, hey, we brought the chocolate, you know, now we can make a delicious chocolate cake. Uh, to make those breakthroughs. So we're not necessarily inventing everything from scratch, but rather bringing something in from often an orthogonal field to kind of make something and bake something that's truly new. The other thing that we do in, the, in my lab, which is maybe a little different from some other uh, groups, is we look a lot at history. And it, it may seem kind of weird to look at uh, history for a group that's called the Future Interfaces Group, but I actually think trajectories in computing are incredibly powerful. And I want to share with you one uh, example of drawing on history to kind of chart the future uh, today, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of how we attack problems. And in this particular clip I'm gonna show you, it's one of uh, Professor Coons, and he's describing Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad system. Now, if you're not familiar with Sketchpad, uh, it's probably a good thing to brush up on a really seminal HCI system, you know, nominally the first uh, CAD program. But even if you've never heard of it before, it's not critical to know. I just want you to listen to what Professor Coons is saying about the past of computing and the future of computing. But keep in mind, this is the 1960s. So listen to how he's describing the old way of using computers and the new way of using computers or the future way of using computers. But little by little, 
he will begin to investigate ideas, and the computer and he will be in cooperation, in the fullest cooperation in this work. Well, now, how does this differ from the way the computer has been used in the past to solve problems? Well, the conventional way, the, the old way of solving problems with the computer, has been to understand the problem very, very well indeed, and moreover, to know at the very outset just exactly what steps are necessary to solve the problem. And so the computer has been, in a sense, nothing but a very elaborate calculating machine. But now we're making the computer be more like a, almost like a human assistant. So there's a lot kind of packed in there, but what I really like about this little stretch, and it's a much longer video, is he's talking about the old way of solving problems. And again, this is, this is 1960, you know, right? Um, and so he says, you know, the old way of solving problems is that you had to understand the problem that you want to set out to solve very well. Uh, and you had to know sort of all the steps necessary to solve that problem. And that, uh, you know, computer is essentially just a very glorified calculating machine. And I think if we're kind of honest with ourselves, that's still how we use computers today. We use them as a tool to get things done. So even if we want to, you know, if we want to look up a French toast recipe, we sort of know where to go. You know, we go to Google, we type in what you know, we know, we know how to formulate the search. It's fairly mechanical, even though it's sort of a relatively undefined problem. And even something that's, you know, relatively creative, uh, like, you know, using Photoshop to, you know, touch up a photograph, uh, that still is a set of kind of processes that you go through. So yes, there are still some open-ended questions, but you sort of know what to do. You weren't necessarily just exploring it, uh, you know, from scratch every single time. And this is very much what we do with a lot of tools, both physical and digital tools. But what I like is actually this second quote a little bit more, which is that the computer and the user will be in the fullest cooperation and we're making a computer almost like a human assistant. So what's really interesting about this is that notion of fullest cooperation. Uh, I find this really intriguing because this is not how you describe a tool, right? You don't say when you're using a hammer or a paintbrush that you're cooperating with a hammer or cooperating with a paintbrush, right? You use a paintbrush, you use a hammer. And so I think even back in the 1960s, people were thinking about using a computer for something much, much more and much more like a human assistant. Actually, later in the video, they use a term called uh, using the computer is a coherent partner in the task. And I think that's a wonderful uh, term. And it's obviously a term that's, you know, echoed by a lot of other computing pioneers like Engelbart and Bush and Licklider and, and so on. So I think we are very much stuck still, you know, 70 years later, uh, that we're still very much stuck in the computer as a tool era. And we're nowhere near this wonderful idea of a computer as a coherent partner. That still is this sort of intangible uh, future. And so if we want to, we kind of buy into this, hmm, that'd be kind of an intriguing thing to explore. We have to go back to the question that I posed before. You know, what are those computational ingredients that we're missing to enable that future of computers as partners? What do we need to bring to that kind of, you know, bake off to be able to unlock this potential future? And I think a central pillar of that is context awareness. This is a, one of our, not the only one, but certainly a major uh, impediment to actually realizing computers as partners and computers as much more rich assistants. Now, if you're not familiar with the term context awareness, it's what you might imagine it is for humans as well. It's to, to basically be aware of one's surroundings, and that includes both physical and social dimensions. So just to kind of set the stage here, here are some example social or some different context rather. Uh, you might have you know, a student that's focusing really hard to finish an assignment, a business person in the office trying to close an important deal, a frustrated driver or a family uh, dinner. And these are obviously all very different physical spaces ranging from domestic to professional. And there's also very different social settings, right? There's alone in an office, there's together with family. So this is very, you know, very different. And so you might think, well, how would you, if you, if you, anyone in this phone, anyone in the Zoom call had a human assistant just, you know, dedicated to their lives, if that human assistant were in these different situations, would they react differently across these contexts? And I think we would all agree that they would. For example, you might get a, you know, a bad piece of news, but it might, you know, a human assistant might decide to withhold that until after uh, the student had finished the homework because it wasn't that critical to interrupt. But if it's related to dinner, you know, perhaps there's a guest that's running late, or maybe the food is you know, burning in the oven, even though the, the cost of intrusion at a social family get together, like a Thanksgiving dinner is incredibly high, a human assistant might decide that this is highly relevant and important that I'm going to intrude anyway. So this notion of sort of dialing up and down our intrusive capabilities is something that human assistants do fantastically well. And our smartphones and smartwatches, they don't even know, they have no knowledge really about different contexts. The only thing they might know is that you're sleeping and they're not gonna ring in the middle of the night. And that is like a 1% the way towards this future. 
So unfortunately, it means that computers are very kind of dumb. They're very context dumb. They're very good. They're not very good assistants. They're great tools, but not very good assistants. That's what I would argue. They tend to interrupt us and distract us rather than keeping us uh, focused. And the idea of a computer proactively helping us, you know, your phone waking up, your smartphone waking up to prevent us going down some wrong path, that's essentially science fiction today. And it's because they know very little bit about the immediate world around them. They don't know that you're having dinner. They don't know that the dinner might be burning. So how are we supposed to ask them to be context aware when they're missing even the most rudimentary information about the physical world? So I think it's kind of crazy, right? That we have all these smart speakers uh, and they're sitting on your kitchen countertop, supposed to be you know, the assistants to help you cook dinner and so on, but they have no idea they're even in a kitchen, let alone that you're making dinner. I mean, you have to literally set in like a drop-down menu, this is the kitchen speaker. And even then when you set that, I don't think it actually parameterizes itself at all. So how smart can that be? Uh, and I think it's even more kind of egregious with smartwatches, right? Uh, you can ask that smartwatch, you know, what's the history of Sydney or Australia? Or tell me what the real time, you know, traffic conditions are in Sydney. And it'll happily tell you, you know, what the weather's going to be, the, the traffic and so on in Sydney. But it knows nothing about your own hands. You know, if anything, it should be the mat. It should know more about your hands than anything else on the planet because it only lives 10 centimeters away. And it doesn't even know what your hands are doing at all. I don't even, a lot of watches don't even know um, that they're even on a wrist, you know, which is pretty crazy. So there's a weird kind of impedance mismatch between these devices that they're incredibly smart in some ways and incredibly dumb in others. And that, that's something that we want to try to solve. So to achieve this kind of notion of computers as partners, we need to, you know, it's going to take some time to build up to that. And I think context awareness is a really critical ingredient. And really to build context awareness, we need to get knowledge of the physical world. We have to build up to this. Uh, and I'm going to show you today a bunch of different projects that are attacking this uh, vision, and we're doing it in multiple different ways to kind of give you a flavor of the scope of this problem. So I want to start with actually one of our earliest projects in this domain, which is called synthetic sensors. It's the notion of virtualizing sensors instead of having to stick them all over your world. And what we did it, in fact, this started in, in 2016, is we tried to do an inventory, kind of a survey of all the different sensor boards that are out there in the world. And we looked at both academic and commercial systems. We made this sort of chart and it showed what kind of sensors are people putting onto these different boards. If you went out and got one from Texas Instruments or Bosch or you know, ST Micro, one of these sensor makers, they made these little kind of IoT sensor boards, but they actually didn't have all that many sensors on them, typically just three or four. And so what we said is, why don't we just go like on DigiKey and just go wild and just order every sensor we can possibly order with the only exception being camera. We didn't want to put a camera on this because obviously that's incredibly uh, kind of privacy invasive, especially in people's homes. So we just left off the camera, but we took everything else to sort of make this almost a super sensor board. And this is what that board looked like. A lot of these uh, sensors that are on there are multifaceted. So we have a single sensor for temperature, barometer, and humidity, for example. We have another sensor that can detect the illumination in a room and also the color of that light in a room, which is kind of interesting. And here's what that sensor board actually looks like in reality. So in this case, it's USB powered. Um, but in reality, uh, it, you can just imagine this plugging in uh, anywhere on the wall. Now you might be thinking, hmm, you know, why go with wall power? Well, number one, it lets us run much more sophisticated machine learning than having to build something that can run on coin cell batteries. And more, and, and, and by virtue of this, we can also run those sensors at much higher frequencies to capture fine grained data. But also using wall power sidesteps a really important problem of not having to replace any kind of batteries. Uh, it also meant that we have to sense things from afar, right? So you're going to plug this into a wall outlet in your kitchen, let's say, um, but how is it going to sense what your toaster or your you know, refrigerator or your coffee machine is going to do across the room? And that's when we have to get clever with machine learning. We actually, the most kind of conventional way to do this kind of uh, sensing is to have some sort of a battery powered IoT style device, uh, low, relatively low cost, you know, maybe 10 bucks, 50 bucks, something in that price range. And you can go around your house and kind of stick these little battery powered sensor tags all over your home. But we actually did a survey of what kind of things you'd want your, let's say, a smart speaker to know in your home. So, for example, is the stove on? Is the rice cooker done? Is the laundry machine done? Is the dishwasher running? Is the front door open? The garage door open? You know, the, some window open? Fire alarm going off? And if you just make this list of everything that you think, of, you know, again, if you had a, like a butler in your house and he knew the entire state of your house, how many things would that be? And when we made that list, it turns out to be about 50 to 100 things in a typical Western household, if you really wanted to have a truly smart assistant. 
but consumers are never going to go for having a battery powered, you know, coin cell powered device. You have to buy a sack of them at Home Depot, you know, a hundred of these things and replace their batteries, you know, every three months. It really is not going to work. So instead we said, we want to have one sensor per room. So if you have a 10 room house, you buy 10 of these sensors uh, and then you're, and then they use wall power. So you never have to replace the batteries. Basically plug and play. So here's what actually happens with that sensor. In this case, it's running, but you can't quite see, but it's just behind the faucet plugged into the countertop there. And here's one of my, my former PhD students, Gerard Laput, walking around. He's turning on various things in this kitchen. And on that laptop, just here for illustration, is the signals that the sensor board is uh, detecting. And it's making a classification. It's listening to the sounds, the heat, the humidity, all those different uh, things, vibrations that are happening in the kitchen. And it can actually sense everything that's going on in that kitchen from that relatively disadvantaged uh, location. Uh, so, you know, this obviously, this sensor is plugged into kind of that outlet behind the, the room there. And again, it's sort of the master of that domain. It knows everything it needs to know about that bathroom. So it's a very versatile sensor. You can almost think of it like a Swiss army knife uh, of, of sensors. You don't have to have something special for your dishwasher and something different for your front door. It sort of is a one sensor to rule them all kind of approach. Now, those basic activations that I were showing you, you probably just saw it just said, you know, microwave, not microwave, faucet, not faucet. Um, those are binary activations. And so we call those first order synthetic sensors. But what's interesting is that you can start to construct higher order sensors from those first level sensors. So you can start to track more sophisticated semantics like the rate, the count, and the state of things. So here's an example, uh, again, in this room, uh, there's a sensor that can hear the sound and the vibrations of a towel being dispensed. And there's a sensor that sits above it that says, well, I know when it was last refilled. And so I can keep track of how many towels are being used over time. So I have a notion of volume or quantity. Uh, here's another sensor. Again, there's a sensor that's detecting flow. And there's another sensor that sits on top of it that actually accumulates the water usage, for example, for an entire household for you know, powering more sustainable activity on social media and so on. So you don't even have to stop at these second order sensors. No, count and state and rate are nice, but you can actually keep on building up the stack, higher and higher level semantics. So you can imagine at some point, if you could get to fifth, sixth, seventh order synthetic sensors, you might have a sensor that's still a true or false sensor, but it's, is, the fa is a family eating dinner? Is it Thanksgiving? Uh, you know, do they have guests over? Are they interruptible? Are they watching TV? And there's no sensor for a Thanksgiving dinner. Right, So it, it's not like there's a special sensor you install in your table that is uniquely detecting that. But instead you can imagine a wide variety of sensors. It might be how many times the refrigerator door is open and closed, the ambient sound level in the room, the number of occupants, uh, the fact that you started the oven really early in the day. And all these sort of low level sensors trickle up probably with the power of deep learning to enable this sort of meta semantic level sensor that again, a human assistant would understand, but that we don't really have good uh, kind of knowledge or techniques to deal with today. And then of course you could have applications that essentially are event driven that says, you no, know, when Thanksgiving dinner equals true, you know, then, you know, tune this Spotify playlist to whatever oldies or whatever you want to do. So you can start to, as a developer, almost attach behavior that's much more sophisticated than you could with, you know, accelerometer exceeded two Gs. And you know, what is a smart device going to do with such low level data? So this project is alive and well, uh, both with industry partners and at CMU. And there was a new effort at CMU led by another professor, Professor Agarwal, who installed these sensor boards or a derivative of these sensor boards at a new building at CMU. You can see it here, just finished construction uh, this semester. And there's about 350 of those sensor boards in this building. Essentially, it's a fully instrumented building. I think it's every room except the bathrooms. You know, we thought that was a bit of a bridge too far. But nonetheless, this, this serves as a living laboratory to explore what does it mean to actually have a smart building, not just a smart building that can sense if there's an occupant in the room. And that's a binary occupancy count. That's not a smart building. But what does it really mean to have a building that really knows about itself and what its occupants are doing? And also simultaneously, what are the kind of privacy implications for this? Where is that boundary where we're improving the sustainability and comfort of the building? And when does it become kind of just creepy? And those are important research questions that we have to figure out you know, in the future. So moving on, kind of in a very related uh, kind of thread of research is after we finish that super kind of sensor project is because we have such a diverse array of sensors, I think something like 12 or 13 different sensing channels in total, is we could go back and 
do a machine learning analysis and see what sensors were the most important for classification. You know, was the humidity sensor more important than temperature? Was the microphone more in sensor uh, more important than the uh, vibration sensor, for example? And so we could rank order which ones are most powerful. And maybe not surprising is that the acoustic sensor, the audio sensor, was the most useful. And it turns out that humans going about their daily lives produce sound and vibrations in the course of a lot of different activities, typing, you know, brushing their teeth, walking upstairs and so on, or eating, you know, cooking dinner. And so those produce vibrations that go into the air and they're very distinctive. And so we can actually do a little test if people are willing to play along here is I'm going to play a very short uh, video clip, but you can close your eyes and I want you to pretend to be the machine learning classifier. So listen to the sound and see if you can guess without any context at all what that activity is. So here we go. Close your eyes and listen to these sounds and you can even put it into the chat if you're if you're brave. Okay, if anyone has any guesses, they can put them in the chat, but uh, it was, if you did close your eyes, it was uh, chopping vegetables, then kind of mixing in a ceramic bowl, then starting a vacuum, uh, then what I can see one person, uh, Lisa got it right, uh, and then it was typing on a keyboard, and then finally brushing one's teeth. And those are all very different sounds, and I bet if I really kind of put you to it and I said I wasn't going to continue until everyone made guesses, you'd probably be about 80 to 90 percent accurate. And if I told you the context, like you're in a bathroom or you're in a kitchen, it'd probably bump you up into the 95 to 99 percent of confidence. There are obviously, obviously there are some sounds like a vacuum cleaner and a blender that can sound similar if you're kind of unfamiliar with the context. So we sort of imagine using sound as a really powerful uh, device. Almost all these, you know, most computing devices include a microphone now. It's really one of the most ubiquitous sensors, perhaps even more ubiquitous uh, than an IMU. And so what if we can just use those microphones for real-time activity sensing? Uh, in this case, we sort of imagine, in, you know, in a smart speaker that the user can simply drag and drop in, kind of opt in to what things they want their Alexa or, you know, whatever brand you want uh, to, you know, think about. Do you want it to listen out for a baby crying or uh, the doorbell ringing or the sound of the mail flap, you know, or the mailman dropping off uh, you know, the, the mail, whatever it might be. So you can sort of drag and drop whatever you might want. And actually behind the scenes, the way that we're doing this is we're leveraging Hollywood sound effect data. So it turns out that, uh, you know, CMU has a great film program. So they have licenses to these fantastic sound effect libraries. And they are unbelievable. You know, if you want to find the perfect blender sound for your scene, you type in blender as the keyword. And there's a thousand different blenders all recorded in professional studios. So you can really, you know, find the exact, you know, model and kind of cadence that you want. And those kind of professionally recorded sound effects have no reverb, for example. And so what we can do is we can take that very pure sound, obviously nicely segmented, no background noise, good labeling. And we can take that and actually project it into synthetic rooms. We can say, let's make a fake, you know, 10 by 10 foot tiled bathroom. Let's make a, you know, carpeted living room. And so what we can do is make hundreds of synthetic rooms in which to project a sound. And we can also vary their amplitude, vary their pitch a little bit as well. And so we can actually, from a single sound effect, we actually get a multiplication of a, like 100 times 100 times 100. And so we get this huge expansion uh, of sounds. And of course, we can take a thousand blender sounds and sort of turn them into a million uh, kind of different um, uh, sound effects that are indicative of the real world environment. And it lets you build a very powerful deep learning model. So here's some examples of what we might do with this. So uh, this was uh, one that we had running on a smartwatch and it's actually listening for the cough of the user. And it says, hey, you know, I've noticed that you're coughing a lot more than usual. Uh, do you wanna kind of go in and maybe schedule a COVID appointment or something like that? And the smartwatch is launching its screen. You don't have to launch an app or click on an app and do something. It is proactively launching to remind you that your behavior has changed. Here's another one we had running in our lab. You can see this little kind of IoT sensor on the wall there, but it was just keeping a running total of all the different devices in that room. So it could just say, hey, look, the CNC mill has been running for 34 hours without service. You know, maybe someone wants to come by and make sure it's, you know, it's all greased up and, and it's, you know, safe and secure. And this is automatically running, just passively listening to the audio in the room. But the next example is maybe my favorite here. Uh, this is uh, someone turning on a drill press and the smartphone again is proactively waking up and it says, you know, safety first, don't forget to wear your safety glasses. And moreover, because it's deduced that it's a drill press, uh, that it can actually look at the acoustics to try to infer the RPM of the machine. So in this case, it says you're at 3100 RPM. This is ideal for softwoods. 
Uh, but you know, maybe you're trying to cut a piece of aluminum or acrylic. So maybe there'd be a little help button that says, hey, you know, what should I adjust this to uh, to cut a piece of aluminum? So it can't guess the material, it doesn't have any you know, vision. It's just doing it by audio, but nonetheless, it can still be assistive. So in a very similar vein, we, we followed this up with research last year called Listen Learner. And what we found in that previous project is that even though if you trained it on hundreds of, or even thousands of different, you know, blender sounds or faucet sounds or toilet flushing sounds that, and you could permute them in, in millions of different ways, there still wasn't anything as high accuracy as your blender in your kitchen or your kitchen faucet in your kitchen. Uh, the sound of your refrigerator clicking shut in your kitchen. Uh, and so what we found is that even with really good deep learning models, it was really hard to get beyond about 90% accuracy. And so we kind of pivoted and said, what happens if you have a device that's sitting in a room and it just passively listens and learns over time? And then when it's confident at some point that it's learned a new sound, that it prompts the user to intervene. So here's just an example of this. It's just like kind of five minutes of data. So here's someone chopping vegetables. You see it's sort of dropping these dots down into this kind of very low dimensional space. So now we have a new sound of sort of like, you know, cutlery kind of chinking on a plate. And you can see that that's being kind of clustered in a new location. It doesn't sound like a chopping vegetable. So there's two clusters forming. Now the user's running a microwave and we have this cluster forming on the left. <laughs> So you'll see now that that whole cluster turns pink and it's labeled that, not just that one instant, but actually all the previous data it had recorded. And now it knows that, that it can use that data to train a model for what a microwave sounds like. And it picked the microwave because even though there are those sort of two other clusters there, they weren't kind of compact enough and separate enough for it to be confident. We're also projecting, I'll just note that we're projecting this down into a two-dimensional space, but actually this is like a 500th dimensional space. So it's a little, you know, hard uh, to kind of, for a human to rationalize this sort of clustering, but it's a very high dimensional space. But essentially it just sits there, listens. It doesn't know what any of these things are. It's almost like an infant learning for the first time. It knows that things sound different. It, it knows that chopping vegetables or chopping on a cutting board sounds nothing like the hum of our microwave, but it doesn't know what that thing is. We don't parameterize it in any way. And then when it gets confident, it says, hey, just, you know, what is that? And then you tell it, and then it learns as it goes. And after, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, oh, the first week, maybe a month in your kitchen, it's starting to learn all these little tiny clusters. And this is what it'll look like, you know, if you let it run. Now, again, these clusters look like they're overlapping, but sort of imagine this in 3D where they might be separated in Z space. And then if your mind can extrapolate, imagine this in like 500th dimensional space. These actually, these clusters don't collide as much as you might imagine. So this kind of notion, and, and what we found is that once it's learned really, you know, especially with the unique reverb in your kitchen, the unique kind of hum and sounds of your appliances and so on, that this can really exceed that 95, 99% threshold margin, which is really for accuracy, which is what you need for a consumer you know, product. Uh, so this is a very successful uh, approach, I have to say. And what we also found from a kind of an HCI perspective is users didn't mind teaching it. You know, we thought, mm, you know, people generally want a pre-trained model. When you think about speech recognizers and, and such like that, normally we want it to work out of the bag, you know, out of the box, it just works. We don't want to have to sit there for five minutes and train it. Um, but we found that users are a bit more forgiving in this case, that they almost teach it like a child. And, and even when it sometimes gets it wrong, we had some strategy in there saying, you know, if it saw the kind of cluster was moving off to the side and it was a little unsure, it says, was that a microwave? And it said, oh, ho, ho, no, that's, you know, funny, funny, right? It's actually some new appliance that I turned on to whatever, the rice cooker or something like that. And some people were much more forgiving because they saw that it was a learning process and it was a give and take. And again, you normally have to interrupt per people on average, you know, one, 1 1.5, maybe two times per appliance in your kitchen. So if you have, you know, 15 appliances, that's a maximum of 30 times it prompts you uh, for a question. And it can keep on learning. And the fact is at the, so number one is I really believe that you should own your data. This data never has to leave this device. And functionally, that smart speaker knows more about your kitchen than anyone else on the planet because it's sitting there, you know, hours and hours and months and months and maybe even years uh, to really know everything intimately about your kitchen, every little creek in that kitchen it knows about. Okay, so just to pivot a little bit, um, I want to talk about uh, options that we can go for warm. So everything I've showed you before is sort of the speaker or the sensor sitting in a room. But what happens if we want this sort of capability when we're on the go? Uh, and, and, you know, 
obviously really tough issues here. Now, certainly if I were to visit someone's house and they had a smart speaker, would it start to kind of absorb my data? Would I be able to access some of its smart functionality? There's some tricky kind of uh, implications there. So what we might want is something like a smartwatch that travels with us and the smarts travel with us as well. But it's hard to do this in battery powered mobile devices, but we're, we're, we've taken some shots at it. So let me show you some projects. So the first project in this space is EM Sense for electromagnetic sense. And what happens is, uh, just to describe the effect here, is any appliance in the world that uses electricity emits a little bit of electromagnetic interference, EMI. Now, obviously, this is very highly regulated by the FCC in the United States, so it doesn't, you know, interfere too much with things like radio stations and cell phones and so on. But if it's consuming electricity, at the very least, it's emitting 60 hertz kind of noise by virtue of just AC electricity running through it. And if it has some sort of DC switching, or if it certainly has a touchscreen or any sort of digital electronics, those all oscillate and resonate at their various frequencies. And they emit EMI, that's essentially like having a very, very weak radio station. Anything that consumes electronic electricity is essentially a very tiny radio station. And what happens is when you touch your body, when you physically touch an object that has that interference, your body tends to become an antenna for those signals. It's an RF waveguide to get into, you know, give you the technical term, but essentially you become a little antenna for that. Uh, and the signals actually will radiate up your arm. And so we thought, why don't we try placing a sensor onto the user's skin to actually sense those uh, emissions and see if we can actually detect what object the user might be touching from those different uh, radio frequency signatures. So here again is a sort of a long demo reel. And on the laptop, you're actually seeing the raw data as collected by this prototype smartwatch. And it can actually, you know, this is a BMI scale that you're seeing here, um, but it can actually sense that signal uh, up on your wrist. So that's a, a digital scale, but it can, the signal, again, goes through your whole body and can be detected on your wrist. And you can just see with sort of your naked eye that different devices have very different spectra. So this is essentially an FFT. It's showing you the frequency distribution of these different electronic signals. And, you know, a motorcycle or a car, you know, with the spark plugs and alternators and so on, or Tesla, whatever it might be, is going to have very different signals than a power drill or a toothbrush. And so we can use this very unique information to have a smartwatch that knows not only what object you're touching, but at the moment of touch, not that you're just nearby, like Bluetooth and NFC. Sure, I'm nearby lots of stuff. I want to know when I engage with something, when I touch that refrigerator door, or when I pick up my toothbrush, for example. So in this example, just pivoting over some applications is when the watch detects that, you know, you're starting to use your Sonicare, it opens up the Sonicare app and says, hey, make sure you don't brush your teeth for 60 seconds to have good hygiene. Here's that scale again. So it knows that you're on the scale and automatically launches the companion app. In this case, it shows, you know, how much weight you've put on over the pandemic or whatever, right? Your weight history. You can also think about patterns of activity. So, you know, if you're touching, you know, it's 8.30 in the morning, you just touched the refrigerator. Now you're touching the stove. We're going to guess that you're making breakfast. Do you want to listen to your favorite podcast while you, you know, make whatever oatmeal? Uh, here's an example of coming into uh, my office. So, you know, it, it knows the moment I touch my office door and it reminds me, uh, you know, that you have, you know, 12 messages or whatever. So I see that Lisa is asking, is the sensor worn on the inside of the hand in this demo? No, I know that it looks like there's some sort of goofy wires running out of there, but it actually only lives on your wrist. Your hand is totally unencumbered. Uh, in a commercial implementation of this, uh, everything would be bundled into the watch itself, but this is sort of a first round prototype. So in a very similar way, uh, we came up with another project called Vibant. And what we found is that, you know, not all devices, not all things you touch in the world actually use electricity. You know, scissors, for example, uh, are not going to use any electricity. So is there a way to expand this vocabulary of devices that we can sense using another signal? And what we found actually is that vibrations are incredibly distinctive. How you, you know, cut with scissors or how you hold a drill, those produce vibrations by active utilizing uh, that object. You know, a hammer doesn't use electricity, definitely makes vibrations. And what's also great is that the accelerometer inside smartwatches can already do vibration sensing, but you do have to sort of overclock it into a rarely used high speed mode. So let me show you an, a demo here. So at the very top of this laptop is a, is a accelerometer 100 Hertz. And in the middle is the same accelerometer, but we're showing you the full speed data, 4,000 Hertz. So when we turn on this toothbrush here, which is you know vibrating in my hand, is in the 4,000 Hertz signal, you can actually see the minute sinusoidal oscillations of that motor which you could not possibly hope to see in that 100 hertz signal just due to Nyquist. There's not enough fidelity. And at the bottom there, we also show you what the microphone looks like because 
the problem with microphones, they don't have to be touching the object for it to produce sound. So even though I'm not touching the uh, toothbrush, it nonetheless is emitting a sound. But you'll see that only when that toothbrush is on and held in my hand, do you see that oscillation of the motor uh, detected on that middle uh, signal. And this is an unmodified smartwatch. This is just software and machine learning. Uh, and it's just using the onboard IMU. So these are actually the vibrations propagating up into your hand and through your body from devices that you hold. So again, I always like to show uh, signals here. This in this case is a rolling spectrogram. And you can see here all of the different uh, uh, kind of, again, signals from these different uh, you know, devices. So various saws sound different. I mean, they sound different to your naked ear. They also sound different bioacoustically inside your body. Uh, you know, vacuum cleaners, uh, obviously various power tools are great at producing uh, various uh, sounds, but also, you know, kitchen appliances. And these are unmodified. You know, we just went around our house and just grabbed anything we could off the shelf. And, you know, for example, uh, well, okay, I'll let this demo run here. So, you know, it says, you know, classic recipe help, you know, beat the eggs, butter and white sugar together. And it has a, a progress bar that it keeps track for. It doesn't say mix for 60 seconds and you have to either count it in your head or start a timer on your smart speaker. Is If you pause, it pauses, right? You know, it does the tracking for you. It tries to take off a little bit of that uh, cognitive load. Uh, here's just another kind of cute one, but uh, we actually found that you can tune a guitar through the bioacoustics, again, radiating into your arm. And we had like a little tuning app that actually uh, could help you out here. Go for one more demo and then we'll we'll move on. So here's a, a Nerf gun again, just a piece of plastic. Um, but again, it can you can imagine having a watch almost act kind of as a computational companion to this, or like you know even like a very basic form of augmented reality where it's keeping track of sort of the ammo count and it's giving you vibration feedback and things like that, and it knows what your hands are doing by interacting with this totally passive tool. So just a quick example there. Again, what's really cool about this is that these are unmodified devices. Uh, you can imagine that just by the nature of their operation, these tools and devices all kind of operate at different speeds. You know, a scissor sounds obviously very different from a hammer, but even, you know, like your blender and your power drill, they still have kind of resonant frequencies of their different DC motors, their brushless motors and so on that actually make them remarkably distinctive. So we also, at the end of that project, kind of moving on again into the future, we followed it up saying, well, hey, look, a lot of, things you do with your hands are also interesting too. Like even if I'm not grabbing a tool, maybe I'm just scratching an itch or combing my hair or washing my hands in a sink. Can we actually just use the passive sort of the kinetic energy that your hands are providing as a way to sense what your hands are getting up to? So we call these hand activities. Um, and this is a much finer grained approach. Right now, if you have an Apple Watch or you know, kind of Android equivalent, is it might be able to tell you what your body's doing. Are you walking, running, you know, sitting, sleeping, bicycling? Very kind of coarse ambulatory states. But what I want to know what my hands are up to, you know, are they, are they eating dinner or are they doing something else? And so we kind of dove back into this problem to think about how do we actually sense what your hands are getting up to. And we deployed this. We did an experience sampling study. Um, if you uh, uh, are familiar with that HCI methodology, but essentially we, the, the smartwatch turns off for some you know, random period of time, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then the background process wakes up. It starts recording data from the accelerometer. But at this point, the screen is still off. Then after getting you know, five seconds of data, something like that, the screen will turn on, it will vibrate, and it says, hey, user, what were your hands doing just a moment ago? And they say, oh, I was just watching YouTube and doing nothing. Or maybe I was writing a, a note on a post -it note. Maybe I was in the middle of eating dinner. Maybe I was in the middle of taking a shower, whatever it might be. And we collected and recorded uh, that data. And so we had 50 users wear this. We collected about 1,000 hours of worn data and allowed us to analyze you know, how different are these different uh, signals. Um, and so here's a sort of a rank ordering of all the different things that our users uh, labeled and collected for us. There's also a companion smartwatch app that let them type in new categories that weren't necessarily in the dropdown list. And you can see, you know, rank number one is the, the hands idle. So most of the time our hands are doing nothing. For many of you, uh, your hands are maybe just sitting there on your lap or just sitting there, you know, on, on the table, not doing anything. But many of you might be scrolling on a trackpad, you know, thumbing through Facebook or typing a message right now. And that, you know, obviously there's a bit of a bias in our sample we recruited heavily from CMU, but this shows you kind of a makeup of, of sort of what the hands are doing at a very coarse level. And so we selected 25 of those activities uh, to study in greater detail, see, hey, can we actually just get us an off-the-shelf smartwatch to recognize all these things? And these are the, the 25 that we uh, concentrated on. And these are example 
spectrograms, and you can see that some things look pretty different. I mean, the, you can see that operating that uh, power drill is, you can see the resonant modes of that motor, very uh, distinctive. But how different is, for example, you know, clapping or scratching or washing your hands or washing utensils? You know, are those the same or not? So we collected a bunch of data, built a deep learning model, and it actually works surprisingly well. The caveat is that you need to have a sustained activity. So you can see on this uh, laptop, again, raw signals, raw classification happening here, is as jumpy as you transition between things. It really wants you know, three to five seconds of a continuous activity to build up enough confidence. Uh, and you can see that reflected here. Now, in reality, you may even wait on a commercial product, you know, 10 seconds, one minute before deciding you're engaging in a, you know, in a category. Um, but nonetheless, this we'd like to show you the raw signal. You see it stabilizes after a few seconds. So here's using scissors. Now, using a remote control and so on. Here's one of my actually my favorite categories is you know kind of washing dishes and also washing hands. Um, and actually, this uh, had some traction. So one of my students, Gerard Laput. Uh, he graduated uh, uh, a year and a half ago. He went off to two years ago at this point, went off to Apple to start a research group, and they were able to squeeze down a model to do hand washing detection. So if you have an Apple Watch and you noticed at WWDC 2020 during uh, the pandemic, they launched this hand washing detection feature that proactively launches when you wash your hands to start a 20 second timer to encourage good, uh, you know, good uh, hand washing hygiene and prevent the spread of COVID-19. That was inspired. Uh, by this work. Okay, looking here at time. Okay, so I, I want to you know save time for questions. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I'm going to kind of wrap this up. But I want to talk about one more thing that I think is important. I was just glancing at uh, the question. Sorry, I got distracted for a moment. So we've talked a lot about input, kind of smarter input. I also want to talk very briefly about smarter output because I think that's really important as well. And how do we say, so let's say you have these incredibly smart agents, well, how do you get it out into the world? And we've done a bunch of projects, but I'll just show you a one in this space. And it's about the light bulb. So, you know, this is a device that we've slapped on the smart title. And, and I, I'm sorry if there's anyone from Philips here, but I think this was a really egregious uh, overuse of the word smart. Uh, I do think that, you know, if Thomas Edison was around, uh, he'd be extremely disappointed that in you know the 130 years that have elapsed since the you know the invention of the light bulb that all we've really made it you know all we've been able to add to the light bulb is that it changes color and you can connect to like some overly complicated wi-fi app that is remarkably limited progress in my opinion and i apologize if i've offended anyone so i think we should all step back and say well what would it mean to have a truly smart light bulb or at least a a, a more computationally interesting uh, light bulb and so this again is a vision that we've been working on for many years uh, starting back in 2012, 2013, and I started with thinking about projections. So thinking about not only projections, but how you actually make the world sort of a touch sensitive and touch interactive surface. So it can respond to uh, not only kind of touch input, but also sense brightness, colors of things, and just have a rudimentary sense of the environment. So this is what that system looked like in 2013. This is another one of my PhD students, Robert Chow. And he uh, is essentially drawing an app. He's drawing the widgets, the interactors on his world. So imagine when you get to that constructor saying new button, is that actually it's a blocking call and the user has to draw the size and shape and X, Y position on the screen and the screen being your world. So in this case, this is uh, like an away message app that's also projected on the outside of the door. So you can say, you know, I'm in a meeting or I'm working. So here's what that, device look like. There's absolutely nothing special in the hardware here. We literally took an off-the-shelf digital projector and we glued, you know, hot glued a connector. We're really trying to push on the software. But this is a long time ago. This is, you know, this is nine years ago now. Uh, so, you know, where do we stand today? So this is essentially our latest uh, uh, incarnation of this. This is a floodlight sized light bulb computer. So this has got a standard Edison screw base. This actually fits into a standard socket and gets power from that socket. And inside of that 3D printing enclosure is a computer. It has uh, obviously all the necessary power supplies to step you know, the voltage down from uh, 120 AC and also has a depth camera to do the touch sensing. But this actually fits into a standard fixture, but it is pretty chunky, at least for now. And so, you know, you might imagine if you have a desk with an overhead lamp or a desk lamp is you could you know, unscrew that you know, LED bulb and you could screw one of our bulbs. And now that desk can become interactive. This is sort of harkening back to the digital desk, if you're familiar with that work. Uh, you can also imagine you know, in a kitchen, if you have recessed uh, can lights, I have some can lights behind me, you can imagine you know, popping one of those out, installing one of our light bulbs, and now your countertop, your kitchen, is starting to become interactive. 
So here's actually what that looks like. This is actually some older software. And in this case, we left the debug app. So you can see the, the green dots are touch events and the uh, gray dots are hover events. But we can drag things around. In this case, we're actually showing snapping points in the environment. So that orange line is showing you possible snap points. So we can snap that number keypad to the size of that laptop. Uh, all the interfaces, if, you, if for those who want to know, are responsive web apps. Uh, so, you know, any kind of app that supports a responsive layout to run on a tablet or a web browser, like, you know, Gmail or Google Calendar, those all work natively. We're just basically uh, rendering a texture in Chromium and then projection mapping it onto the environment so it comes out square. You don't have to have the light bulb even directly above your desk. It can be at a very uh, kind of weird angle and all the interfaces still come out square and correct. And of course, all these apps support just the basic kind of multi-touch that we have come to love today. So you can pinch and zoom, drag around and, and so on. And, you know, there's some quirks here that you, you don't want it to, for example, you know, run away. If you put your, you know, your mug down, your coffee mug down on the number keypad, you don't want it to inject, you know, spurious input into your spreadsheet on your laptop, but you don't want to run away from people's hands. So there's a lot of computer vision going on to enable this. And so we think about the topography of a desk and how you deal with the topography. Do you put interfaces onto books? Do you snap into books? If I put a book down on top of the interface, does it bubble up or does it slide off to the side? And so we sort of explored this work of desk topography as a bit of a pun. So I think we're actually getting pretty close to making this a real product. Uh, all the threads of technology are coming together. So I would say really by 2023, it's not impossible to think that you can go to you know, Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a six pack of these light bulbs. And they're essentially smartphones or kind of low end smartphones that have been bundled into a light bulb form factor. You can throw away the battery, don't need that because you have wall power. You can throw away the screen because you're gonna use a, a micro projector instead. And you can also get rid of the touch panel because you're going to use a depth camera. And those are expensive components for now. But you know, with the, the magic of technology, these things are reducing in cost tremendously already. So it's sort of you know smartphone guts, but every other sensor has been changed. But if functionally, you could imagine running Android or iOS stock and all the apps in the respective Play Store can just run by default. The same way they can run an iPad or an iPhone 12 or an iPhone 12 Pro Max. Apps have already been designed to have these responsive layout. Now they can run on your refrigerator door, on your kitchen countertop, on your coffee table, have the Netflix app running right there on your you know, coffee table in front of your TV instead of having to use some remote control. And we're working right now with some OEMs to, to make this a reality. So what you're seeing right here is the world's smallest projector computer. Uh, we worked with a, uh, a team out, out of ASU Beijing. Uh, they are masters of uh, scanned uh, MEMS laser projectors. So what you're seeing here are all the components uh, for a quad core CPU, it has a, a integrated GPU as well, um, has you know, enough RAM and, and, and flash to be able to you know, run a stock Android uh, and uh, has a depth sensing array to detect touches. And in the end, we sort of exceeded our design goals so much that we actually skipped over the uh, light bulb form factor and went actually right to a smartwatch. So this is the world's smallest projection smartwatch as well. And you can see it can support touch interaction right on the skin. But fundamentally, this was just to show off how small we got it. The fact is that you could trivially bundle this technology into something like a light bulb. And you know you could go buy these things for, I don't know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. I mean, again, these things are going to drop in price. You can go on Amazon right now or on Best Buy right now, and you can buy a, you know, a modern Android smartphone for less than $30. That is incredible. Uh, and you know we're, we're going to be able to get these light bulbs down to something like that uh, in the future. Might take 10 years, but it's totally doable. Okay, so just to uh, kind of uh, wrap up my talk here and get the questions, just to kind of put a, a kind of a, a kind of, kind of return back to that historical trend and sort of put a, a cap on this presentation, is I really believe that knowledge is power. Computers right now are incredibly smart in kind of book knowledge, Wikipedia knowledge, but they're not particularly smart in physical knowledge. And I think knowledge is power. And, and we've seen this trend in computing all the way through. So if we kind of look at the, we're gonna chart the progress of knowledge in computing, uh, through the eras, we can see a trend forming. So back to the 1940s and 50s, you know, birth of really modern electronic computing uh, is that computers only knew what was loaded into their memory, right? They knew nothing about the outside world. They didn't know they were computers. They didn't know what was outside that room. Very, very rudimentary. By the 60s and 70s, we start to see a push to actually digitize the outside world and bring it into the computer space, most notably with SAGE, which was a US strategic air defense system that integrated you know, radar and weather data to be able to track you know, incoming you know, bombers and, and so on. But that was a deliberate attempt to say, the outside world has things we wanna know about, let's bring it into the computer domain where we can leverage computer powers. And also in like the 70s, we start to see kind of proto 
internets like the ARPANET, which is again, computers now tapping into way more knowledge than what we're loading into, you know, their memory on magnetic tape or punch cards. And into the 80s and 90s, obviously a huge explosion in knowledge. The World Wide Web is arriving. We start to see weather, you know, obviously a very high, um, high, uh, you know, value item that we want to digitize and people want to know about. We get traffic, real-time traffic integrated into services like uh, Google Maps by the mid 2000s. So we're dragging in more and more of the real world. And then today, really the 2000s until the you know, modern time is IoT has meant that we can bring pretty much the entire physical world into the realm. Maybe it's not publicly exposed, but into the realm of computers. The fact is you wouldn't build a modern commercial building at least without you know, an elevator bank that, had, that was computer controlled, HVAC that's computer controlled, fire alarms, smoke alarms, theft detection, whatever it might be, those are all baked into a modern building. It's not that they're necessarily publicly available on the internet, but they are all networked and they will be able to be tapped into. So we're getting actually very close to that vision, not in the domestic case. I think we have to be much savvier. No one's gonna you know, run POE you know, into every little kind of corner of their house, just the expense is too high. But certainly in the commercial space, we are already there and we're creeping into uh, the com consumer space, but we need to make it more practical. But this is the point I really wanna make about this is if you actually kind of, if obviously this is a unitless thing, but I actually look at that trend and what I see is exponential, that it's getting faster and faster and faster over time, it's compounding. And this is really important because humans are terrible at understanding exponentials. You know, we think we understand exponentials, but we really don't, it's really kind of hard. And actually Scott Hudson had a great talk this past Kai, he got the Lifetime Achievement Award and much of his talk was about how humans have consistently predicted wrong what exponentials really mean. But fundamentally think about this, if you believe me that this is an exponential curve, that computers are gaining knowledge of the physical world at this exponential rate, what it means is that in the next 10 years, we are probably going to bring on more knowledge about the physical world than all of the last 50 or 60 years combined. That's what an exponential really means. So that's going to be this, it's even hard to imagine what that's going to be. It's sort of hard to imagine you know, how much faster can computers kind of get, but yet it happens, or how much better and how much better can graphics get? Everyone's always blind at that moment. And what is this going to mean for knowledge? What are the privacy implications going to be if we have that much knowledge? Is it even a good thing? Well, that's why we're here to uh, research that. But as we stand right now today, you know, for questions like this, right, you know, is my laundry done? Has my mail arrived? How long has my pasta been boiling? Because I forgot, you know, to set a timer. This is what I might call like level one context awareness, where it's not, they're not amazing human assistants, but at least they can answer some basic questions about their immediate environment. And this still has tremendous, I think, end user value. Um, right now, if you say, you know, hey, Google, is my laundry done? It says, I can't help you with that, but here are some social results. Or worse, it'll say, here's the definition of laundry. Really? That's a smart device? No way. So we're getting there slowly. I think this kind of this level of question, we probably are going to get to in the next year or two. There's a lot going on to bring that context awareness. Uh, and I think we're really on the cusp of at least this first level. And then it's going to be interesting to think about what's it going to be for level two, level three, and, and up the stack. Um, I should just quickly acknowledge that, of course, this is not like I just sit there all day long cranking out all these research papers. This is done with an incredible set of colleagues, of which this is just some of them. I want to definitely give them due credit and, and you know check out their pages, uh, uh, look them up online and go check out the incredible research they're doing. But on that note, I'm going to end there and we have uh, a good amount of time for questions. So I did, I'll go back to a question that I saw. I'll try my best to kind of thumb through here. Um, as someone, uh, Smitho was saying, is this related to Zensers, which is also a spin out uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. And yes, Zensers was actually done by uh, alumni of my lab. Uh, and it's a computer vision startup where it's trying to say, hey, there's all these um, uh, cameras in the world, maybe not in homes, but certainly in urban spaces. You know, there's traffic cameras, there's cameras in, restaurants and stores and, and so on, is how do we have AI tap into those to essentially be able to have people create sensors? So, you know, can I have a sensor for, is there a check sitting on my table and how much time has elapsed, you know, before uh, the waiter has come and picked it up? Or maybe they, we can even proactively say, hey, why don't you, you know, come and get the check, the check, you know, the credit card is sitting on the bill kind of thing. And so they're basically showing that these cameras that we've deployed all over the place in at least the public domain and certainly in the commercial domain, they have much more utility than just, you know, having someone 
in a room watching 50 screens. That's the most sort of useless uh, use of them or just recording it to some disc uh, somewhere, um, you know, for future, you know, theft pre prevention, but rather tapping into them and actually making them an actionable uh, part to improve efficiency and make environments safer for pedestrian safety and so on. Okay, Seth is asking, in your kitchen video, the user was alone and quiet. Can the technology handle people talking while chopping vegetables and detect that sound or listening to the TV, et cetera? It's a great question. I didn't show it, but yes, it can detect multiple simultaneous events, but they have to occupy different categories enough. So talking and chopping vegetables, those are acoustically distinct enough that it's possible to maybe do simultaneous sound detection or you know something maybe that's a bit more loud like a blender running and people talking where it gets uh diff or you know certainly if it's in a totally different sensor channel like uh you know the the the, the stove is on which is a more of a thermal signature that you know that's totally independent voice is not going to overload that what, what you do get into kind of uh, a corner case is if you have you know a, a vacuum running and a blender going and there's a kettle boiling and there's a kid screaming in the background where even a human would have a hard time naming all of the things. They might say, I can hear the kid and I can hear maybe the vacuum, but I can't hear the other two. And that limitation is true here as well. So it does get overloaded if there's too many things in sort of one uh, channel, generally acoustic, but even in other things too. So, and, and just jumping to your example of listening on TV, they actually we found that acoustics, you know, obviously the sounds that come out of a TV are incredibly diverse. They're basically every sound that can happen in the real world, like someone chopping vegetables on your TV. But what's unique about listening or watching a TV, if you have a sensor in that room, is the light color. Remember, we have, we have a sensor on that sensor board that's actually detecting the color of the light as well as the luminance of the light. And actually, TVs produce a very particular, the editing in a modern TV show is such that the color changes in a very particular pattern. It's you know, a little bit blue, a little bit red, a little bit green, a little bit blue. You know, and you kind of get this very kind of particular intonation of color changes, which is highly indicative of watching a TV show, which is, so even if you hear chopping vegetables, it may be that you're chopping vegetables watching TV, but if we know we're in a living room, we can probably say, hey, this is not actually chopping vegetables. This is actually someone watching TV and on that TV show, they're chopping vegetables. So there's these little kind of, very hard to know, write all the rules for these things, but if you sort of let the magic of deep learning take over, it can start to actually kind of uh, ferret out all these complex uh, rules. Okay, Brian is asking, can you speak more on the machine learning and predictability? For example, predicting the next action by the user. Hmm, that's a really interesting question. I don't think anything we did, or certainly in these projects that I've shown you, about predicting the next action. We're sort of at this moment, we're sort of saying, hey, can we even just predict what's going on at all at that moment? That's hard enough. Um, but certainly I think uh, th there's a lot, there are other researchers uh, that are researching this. I know Jeff Bigham has looked at patterns of activity, for ex example. And so if you know that, you know, you, you've boiled the kettle, it's very likely you're gonna get a mug, you know, out of the thing, or maybe you'll get a tea bag out of the pantry or something like that. And so obviously if you have long, kind of, you know, you're in situ, and studying people's patterns of activity for long periods of time, you can start to learn uh, the order of things. And you know, typically you, you boil water, you know, before getting the, you know, before putting the tea bag in or something like that. Um, and so yes, it can learn. I have not researched this myself. I'm sort of trying to, you know, get that first Lego in before stacking up the chain to be able to preemptively. Because I agree with you. If you know what they're doing next, you can maybe even step in or have it queued up, or you know, they already you already have the recipe ready to go. They don't even have to ask kind of thing. Um, but you know, baby steps to get to that, but it's a really interesting notion. Um, it's a uh, Seth, one, uh, go ahead, Ted, sorry. Just, just a wonderful talk. And um, um, I don't know if you ever know, knew about it, but I, I had a graduate student making something called the Anything app. And it had a lot of those, these ideas that really, um, I think it's just a fantastic uh, set of goals that, it, that, that of course, um, you know, if you slam a door and and the the phone doesn't feel it but hears it, or if it feels it and doesn't hear it, you know, either of those is fine. And that's that's really what what is possible with this whole context approach. And it's uh, yeah, just I I think it's really um, it's the direction we have to be going. We'll see. I mean, I, I think, and, and I'd be I'd love to hear from all of you. Is that I think it's interesting but I'm still not convinced it's entirely useful. I think there are some killer apps. Like I think, you know, coughing or sneezing onset, um, you know, repetitive stress, you know, if it knows that you're typing for too long or something like that. Um, I think there are very key kind of nice apps, 
But whether or not it's going to be broadly useful, I think actually remains to be seen. And so we want to get to that point where we can deploy this in the wild. Obviously, there are high value use cases like hand washing detection during the pandemic. But I want to know what is that long tail good enough to support this research? You know, if it's just five things, it's a lot of work to build these machine learning models for just five you know, apps that you engage with you know, once a week. So, so the, one, um, the ones we, we did were um, about dancing. So if you put your phone in your pocket and it could recognize skipping versus dancing versus you know, activity detection. Yeah, yeah, but, the, yeah. but the question I want you to follow up on is you brought up the coughing three, uh, several times. And I know that there's you know, people in Oxford, people at CMU, people at MIT, all promising that they can, with 95% accuracy, find COVID before it's become symptomatic. And, and mm -hmm. I, then I hear nothing more about it. Do you know more about how those projects are going or whether you are involved with that at all? Because you have brought it up. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know that I know some of those projects. I haven't read them in any in great detail. Um, a lot of them are trying to look at almost like the cough acoustic quality. And that I have to say, I'm a little bit skeptical on. Uh, there's also, I just, you know, in my own research, just there's so much noise and ambient noise and so on. I, grain of salt. Um, I, I want to see the data and try it myself. Um, what, what I would, what we're trying to show in that coughing example, which in fact, that coughing example was pre pandemic, is more about patterns, right? So it's not a single cough. It's more about, hmm, you're coughing at a higher frequency than usual. That should be something that could be checked out. I think making the claim that that's COVID is actually a, a pretty strong one. Um, but even if it sends someone in to go get a test and it comes back negative, that's still okay with me. Um, but it's, it can be a good prompt, you know, for all these things. Even, you know, we, a lot of people are asking us about like smoking cessation and things like that, or are they just drinking too much coffee or, you know, whatever it might be, maybe not drinking enough water. So, you know, there's definitely a personal informatics angle to this as well, in addition to the proactive assistance, is people do want to sometimes unpick their, their habits. Um, so yeah, so I don't know specifically about the COVID recognition. That does seem like an extraordinarily uh, you know, well, difficult problem. But certainly if I wasn't coughing at all last week and I'm coughing my, you know, hacking my lungs out this week, you know, maybe I should you know, take a look at that. There are a couple of different approaches and the people at uh, MIT are saying that they have 95%, but they have false positives. And so it's, you know, like you said, go in and check it. What I want uh, people to think about here is um, this is a really um, different way of thinking about HCI than a lot of you do when you're doing your, you know, making frames and, and thinking about GUIs as being user interfaces. And I really think that this is a fantastic chance to ask Chris, who's, who's been thinking really deeply about, about bringing in other, other modalities um, for, for a long, long time now he's been doing this and, and also using different ways of sensing uh, things. And, you know, um, so I think that please, please add your questions. The one, one I will ask um, is, Chris, what about um, time to, to um, uh, frequency response? In other words, you have, to get, you have to get confidence that you're actually recording what you think you're recording. And how has that been, that, that getting rid of the latency in, in uh, detection of, of activities? I mean, I think it varies by what, what activity, you know, if it's, if it's some very particular kind of, um, you know, recipe helper or something like that, typically you can't be, have much more latency than maybe 500 milliseconds or, you know, one second, right? Otherwise people are going to prompt. I'm sure we've all had that experience of asking a smart speaker for something. And there's this, this very unusual and non-human pause. You know, it's just a little too long that you actually start asking your question again, and it's already trying to respond. I'm sure we've all had that experience. I know I definitely have that with my uh, Google speakers. Um, so you have to get the timing right on some things. If it's something more passive, you know, like cough detection or hand washing detection, you know, that gives you a bit more wiggle room because that's going to take you, you know, five seconds or more to do. It can be five seconds late, right? So you can kind of, you know, especially with something like hand washing detection, which is, you know, you do things that are hand washing like throughout the day, right? You know, I'm giving a talk, I'm kind of, you know, moving my hands around. Is that hand washing? No. So you sort of have to let it run for five or 10 seconds to really build up enough confidence that you are taking a shower or eating dinner. And you know that you're also eating dinner, you know, with friends, these different meta considerations. So uh, yeah, I don't think it's a one size fits all. I think it really depends on the end you know, user experience and uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah. Do you see Seth asking about what happens when there's other noises around than the one person? Yes, we, we, I think I already answered that question, but Seth, if I didn't, uh, right, definitely good. chime in. Um, and then there's this, um, um, machine learning and predictability question. You've dealt with that probably. Yes. Um, okay. uh, and Seth also asking, he can't wait to buy some of these sensors. Well, actually it may be possible to get some of the sensors. If you contact that professor, Professor Agarwal, 
uh, he does have some uh, sensors. So if you have a compelling use case, I'm sure you can shoot him an email or you're welcome to email me and I'm happy to put you in touch with him uh, if you want to play around with those. But what's actually kind of exciting is since we launched that project, that again, that project goes back to 2016, is <laughs> through a lot of discussions with various sensor makers is that the trend in industry has been to release these ever capable, more kind of Swiss army knife sensor boards. So actually the trend is towards this notion of general purpose sensing. That's the term we tried to coin in that first paper. Uh, and now actually there's been, I just saw a paper that actually is kind of actually um, a retort saying general purpose sensing is a bit too lofty. If we're not quite there yet, which I really appreciate people pushing back on that notion is, is it actually possible? It's a great idea, but is it possible? Um, but actually the trend in industry is towards general purpose sensing now and kind of uh, machine learning uh, operating on these devices. Um, I will also just add that I'm a big believer. You might, I, I'm, I'm surprised that no one has brought up any sort of privacy implications because I think this is really <laughs> uh, you know, a massive one. Um, uh, and what I advocate for all of these projects is you always want the user, I think, to own their data and the data never should just be streamed willy nilly off to the cloud. I think it's actually kind of laziness uh, for a lot of these companies, uh, may, maybe even a little tad malicious, that they, they have to stream off, you know, your raw audio uh, to the cloud because they you know, claim they need to do it for transcription. Computing has gotten incredibly powerful, even for embedded uh, computers. And so I don't see why that data has to leave. All the projects I showed you were at the edge classification. Nothing left that device or maybe went to a laptop, but that laptop is now as powerful as your smartwatch. It all should be happening on device. And, you know, again, your unique data, I really do believe belongs to you. That doesn't mean you can't extract and do fleet learning to extract that generalizable knowledge, but there's no reason you need to send off WAV files to Amazon or Google or, you know, name, name your tech company. Um, so I think we can do better. And I think that I, I have to say, I, I do give some credit to Apple that they're, you know, very strong stance on privacy. I do have tremendous respect for uh, And I think that consumers are starting to be more savvy in this and pick uh, companies that are supporting their values in terms of privacy. And I really hope that's a continued trend. So I don't think it has to be a surveillance society and, or, you know, and, and I trade all my privacy. I don't think that these are kind of, and have smart sensing. I, some people see those as being diametrically opposed. And I think with good design and thoughtful human centered design um, that we can, we can do it. Any way that we can be transparent about that? Yeah. I mean, I think companies should be honest. I mean, I think it's actually somewhat opaque that when people buy a smart speaker, I don't think a lot of people really know, you know, everyone in this room, we're all experts, right? There's an expert blindness, right? Um, but uh, I don't think actually the average lay user necessarily realizes that their audio is being shipped off to, you know, servers and archived for, you know, until the aliens come in 5,000 years, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, I think we should be more transparent. I think that's healthy for, for, for the industry. And I don't think it has to be a kind of a deep, dark secret we sort of sweep under the rug. I think it's better to be more honest. Uh, and I think there's a market opportunity. If there's any, you know, anyone listening that's at one of those big companies, I think that consumers are getting savvy and there's a market opportunity to lead by example and be and put privacy first. Mm -hmm. um, a question about the projector on your wrist, um, yeah. on your on your forearm. Uh, you know, we a lot of people might know that you, you know, really started the whole field of of measuring vibration in skin. Of course, when muscles are tense, it doesn't work right. Um, were you using optical or vibration in those buttons on that on that demo that you were um, uh, showing us? So I went through it very quickly, but on that device was a very small depth sensing array. So it's basically like a it was like a a very low dimensional camera. I think there's only like something like thirty pixels in the entire camera, but it's good enough to find a fingertip. Again, in this case, we have the advantage of it being on the arm, so it sort of can just look out. It doesn't have to look up or down. It has to look out, and so it actually finds your finger. And obviously, when it touches the skin, you sort of break the beam, per se. So it's just basically, you can think of it as a very, very, very low resolution depth camera that could be incredibly small that you could fit into the bezel of a watch. So yeah, no, no acoustics, no vibration. It's actually like a very rudimentary computer vision in that example. Very beautiful. Um, so I'm just looking at a question from Brian, who says, what other modality mixes have you tried? You no know, acoustic, light levels, time of day? I mean, in that first part, I would encourage you to read the paper, Synthetic Sensors, and there's also a follow-on paper where we talk about constellations of those sensors. So, you know, if you have two rooms that are adjacent, can the two rooms actually work together? You know, maybe the room that's on the other side of your bathroom, does it pick up vibrations from the plumbing stack despite not being in the room? And the answer is yes. Um, but we, what's interesting is that that Synthetic Sensors paper really looked at weird combinations. It was this great example, I remember, that we were so mystified. We had to go back to the user to ask, what was happening, but we saw the pattern was you know, they came home at night. It was a student that came home at night 
And we saw the lights turn on. So the, 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 you know, went from black to kind of brownish incandescent light. And then uh, we saw that uh, the, uh, we have a, we have a Wi-Fi you know, chip on there, but also it can sense the, the Wi-Fi noise. So basically, are, is there packet collisions or interference? So we see our Wi-Fi signal craters, there's basically interference going on. Then there's this big boost in humidity. We're like, what's going on here? No, And then, then we see kind of flashing lights that are indicative of TV. And then again, the Wi-Fi signal decreased when that was happening. And so we went back and said, what are we doing Thursday night? You know, are you willing to tell us? And so they told us. And basically, they came home and they turned on the lights and they turned on their microwave. That actually was interfering with the Wi-Fi. And then actually the thing that boosted the humidity was they had made ramen for themselves. So when they opened up the door and all this kind of plume of steam came out, it actually was enough to raise the ambient humidity in the room. And then they went and sat down and watched Netflix, it was streaming. And so that actually impacted the Wi-Fi again, because there was basically congestion on the Wi-Fi. And so when you, you know, it's a, that's just one example, but that pattern of activities kind of going back to an earlier question, is it's like really hard to write rules for all these things. I don't have, okay, I don't want to sit there and write a rule for, you know, comes home, makes ramen, watches Netflix, right? Like that, there'd be a million things you'd have to write. But slowly over time, you start to see these patterns emerge. And the, the you know, it says, I always see the humidity before the TV, or I always see microwave and humidity, that's cooking something that has a high liquid content. You start to break it down into the constituent parts and you start to become much more aware. Um, but that's that's an example of how you have to draw on the, all these different senses to really understand what's going on. That's someone you know sitting by themselves, you know, watching TV at eleven o'clock with a you know, you know microwave ramen. Um, so I don't know. It just it just reminded me of that story. Uh, a great story. Uh, so Lisa is asking of all the possible sensors that you catalog. Is there a sensor that can detect an odor and the chemistry producing? Oh, that's oh. a great question. So a lot of people ask this, you know, why didn't you include like a kind of a smoke detector functionality and. There are sensors out there that can do air quality and you know, particulate count. And I get, I mean, there's got, basically you could do, there even are sensors that are essentially mass spectrometers that are like an embedded chip now, pretty amazing. Um, we didn't include them because they were relatively expensive sensors. They're quite bespoke sensors really made for like scientific equipment. And so they cost on the order of like $50 per sensor. And we wanted to keep our entire board, even in the small volumes that we were doing under $100. And so we sort of made, you know, at some point we said, that's kind of getting sophisticated enough. We're not going to include it. But the cost of those sensors has come down a lot. I think you could absolutely include a particulate sensor, carbon monoxide sensor. Um, I don't know about an odor sensor. I'd have to look into that a bit more uh, on a new version of this board. So there's totally room for like a super, super, super sensor where now instead of having, you know, 15 channels, it has 25 channels. And what does that mean? Does that mean that we can even get even finer grain things? And are you cooking something on the stove? that's releasing a lot of, you know, volatiles or smoke or whatever. And we might've been able to say, this is, you know, a chicken piccata. I mean, I, I don't know. I think that the sky is sort of limitless. And I think it's also possible that as you dial up the sophistication of the sensors is it starts to eat away at the need for computer vision. I mean, I think computer vision people are seeing as this big hammer, you know, oh, if I have a camera, sure, I can tell you that you're cooking pasta, right? But, you know, who really wants a camera in their house? I, I know. I don't, but I'm not sure if they, you know, if there was a very clever odor sensor and it could, you know, it, it was monitoring basically my calorie intake. Uh, and maybe there was a way to, to sense what the volume of food is, the amount of, you know, odors and particulates and so on. It was kicking off that it knew what the dish was or how much oil I was using. And it could give me estimates of my calorie count or whatever. That'd be pretty, pretty cool. And I think that's, you know, within reach. Um, so it's an excellent idea. I, I, I haven't looked at those sensors in a while, but I think that's a really. So the sensor in a, in a CO2 sensor is basically a gel and it's the light going through a gel. So it doesn't have to be the $50 that, that people uh, charge for that sensor. Uh, the, the AQI sensor, that, that is a laser looking for particles and that's, mm -hmm. that's more expensive. But if you think about it, that's what a, those cheesy smoke to sensors are that you have in every room too. Yeah. They have a little bit of a radioactivity putting out stuff and seeing if they get blocked by dust. So so depending, if you wanted to be fancy, there, there are ways of getting cheap sensors for a lot of these things. But for smell, the problem is that that photospectrometer you're talking about is the scary business because really there's a lot of things going on for smell and, and checking out different, different molecules is a tough business. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, the march of progress and there's incredible people working at all the major sensor companies. So, you know, these sensors that used to be $50 are, you know, coming down to five, one, I mean, who would have thought you could put, you know, 10 different sensors on a board with a pretty powerful microcontroller that can do machine learning right at the edge um, and do that for under a hundred bucks. You know? and, and I think if you made that sensor today 
in volume. We only made 500 of those sensors. If you made 500 million of those sensors or you know whatever number it is, I'm sure you could get the the the, the bomb down to under 20 bucks. So I you know I really do think you know you can again go to Home Depot, you buy a sack of these things, get a 12 pack for 100 bucks. It's not unrealistic. Uh, certainly, if you bring the economies of scale that you know that we can. Uh, so yeah. It's one really one last question I want to ask you is I mean your 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 company is exciting, your research lab is exciting. Um, what do you need? What what you know? What are things that you would like people to be bringing to you or asking of you? What kind of a student should be thinking about trying to join your group or what what you know or your company? Just uh, anything there? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I always love to talk to people, and I love being able to engage, you know, with folks uh, like you. Um, so, I mean, students that are interested, shoot me an email. You know, we're always, you know, recruiting and looking for new PhD students. And uh, a lot of the students are even undergraduate or master's students. So if you're thinking about coming to CMU, definitely, uh, you know, you know, just shoot me an email. If you're in industry and you think that there's uh, things that you've seen that would resonate with people at the company, or maybe there's even specific technologies, absolutely looking to, to work with you. We work with industry partners all the time. Uh, some of the collaborations I can't talk about, but you can imagine that there, you know, there's going to be interest around some of these projects. I already mentioned a project uh, with Apple. And so uh, you know, I, I do believe in tech transfer. And you know, I've created a startup company to commercialize some of those technologies. And I'm super happy that if, you know, we've been able to get you know, hundreds of millions of, of, of pieces of our software installed on people's smartphones and, and smartwatches. Um, but there's other outlets, uh, you know, like direct uh, tech transfer. And I always just love to hear if people have interesting ideas, you know, just shoot me an email. I'm, I'm pretty responsive on email. You, like I, I pretty much respond to all my email. Uh, so if you know you have some follow-up, uh, my, my email address was in the presentation, but I'm sure Ted can, can share it afterwards as well. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, I think, you know, this is a community. That's the cool thing about HCI. Um, I do believe it is a community, and I'm and it was it was really fun to be able to present with you uh, tonight. And I see that Brian's also asking about open source. I would say probably at least half our projects are open source, and you can check them out on our GitHub. If you uh, search for Fig Lab F I G L A B uh, GitHub, uh, you can see uh, you know probably all the all the projects that are public right now. And then Lisa's asking about the story of uh, the startup name Kikso. Uh, Kikso is actually a Somali word for analysis. Uh, and we are a machine learning company, so that seems fitting. Um, but there's a longer story there. It's still a bit of an unusual uh, name. And it, it came down to a couple of things, one of which being just a, a short five letter domain with a, you know, a, a dot .com domain name available, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, yeah, we, we, we like the, the ring of it. It's a great And one. if you're in the Bay Area and you're looking for a new venture, our offices in Mountain View were sort of hybrid. Uh, right now, but some people are working remotely. And if you're really interested to dig into you know, how HCI and machine learning intersect uh, and thinking about either on the business opportunities end or digging into what the HCI implications are, uh, we're, we're hiring and, uh, and uh, would, would love to hear from you. Fantastic. Um, as I expected, um, a, a really great talk. Um, and I know that for each of the projects in involved, there's probably great papers and depth to all of it and real real data behind it and lots of analysis. Um, and I hope everybody here uh, takes takes the opportunity to go look up Chris and find out about all the, uh, the great research that is behind all of these demonstrations. Um, and I see somebody's put up, uh, you have uh, put up your word because they can look for it. And with that, I think that really um, we should probably, it's a little later where Chris is, so we probably should let him uh, go back to his life. And, uh, and uh, we really appreciate this. It will be up on our website um, pretty quickly. Steve Williams uh, often puts the work into getting it up uh, immediately. So if you want, people want to watch the video, that'd be great. Um, I want to apologize that something broke in Zoom on my computer and I wasn't able to be quite as responsive as I wanted to be at, uh, at the end of the talk, but Chris, Chris uh, met the challenge, so thank you. Um, and with that, I, I want to uh, say we can adjourn the, uh, the meeting for this evening, and, and I hope that um, you all come to the next, the next program meeting next month, which will be announced by Nancy and Smitha soon. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.
Great going, Ted. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Literally Zoom broke on me and I couldn't and I couldn't have and all my controls went away. And I uh, and then it looks like you uh, managed to log in through a second device potentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, and I'll we'll have these conversations on other on other forums. Uh, good to yep. see you. Okay, bye bye everyone.